It might just be me, but we're seeing large language models nowadays everywhere. With stable diffusion, they've really brought AI to the attention of those outside of the field. I mean, who doesn't know about ChatGPT? But using those large language models isn't that straightforward. Now, the performance might not be what you expect from the hype. In this video, we will go through three common ways of improving your large language model. We will start with the easiest and slowly build up from there. So let's just get started. What we have here is a Google Colab notebook, and that's a notebook that you can follow along with this video. I will put the link of this, uh, of this notebook in the description. There are three common ways to improve an LLM. We have prompt engineering, we have something called retrieval augmented generation, and finally fine tuning the model but in a very efficient manner. Before we will do so, we will first need to load in the large language model. We're using Llama 2. Llama 2 generally performs quite well. You can apply for Llama by creating a Hugging Face account, get access, and finally get your Hugging Face token, which you will need to, um, to show that you have access to the model in order to download it. Now, the reason we're using Llama 2 is because it performs relatively well, uh, even at a smaller size. So what we have here is the so-called Open LLM leaderboard, and it's a leaderboard for large language models. It isn't a perfect measure, but it gives you an idea of which models generally perform well. And whilst filming this video, of course, I'm choosing Llama 2 because it's at the moment one of the better performing models, but in six months time, that might change. So you can use this leaderboard to select a different one that might be better suited to your specific use case. We can select the model sizes. A smaller model size is obviously easier to load, but might not be as accurate as you want. You can even choose whether the model was pre-trained or not. And then you can simply go through the models and see which one works best for your use case. Personally, I like opening one and seeing the amounts of downloads they have. It shows to a certain degree their popularity and popularity to a certain extent indicates whether the model is performing well for a lot of users. So go through the leaderboard, maybe select a different model and see if you can that way also improve the performance. Let's go back. We have chosen Llama 2 and we, we, need, we need to load it in. More specifically, we've chosen the base model it's it is fine-tuned but it's fine-tuned on chat data to you know create a sort of chat gpt like experience and we're loading in the 13 billion parameter model and this model i really love using it's really really accurate of course if you go with more parameters it generally becomes more accurate and more performant uh, but we still need it to perform relatively fast right if i ask it a question i want a question back quickly and i don't want to wait for a couple of minutes so that's why i'm choosing this one you can choose any other that you're interested in now there's some tricks going on here to make sure that the model loads and that's called four bit quantization essentially we're compressing the model to make sure it uses less gpu memory because that's the main bottleneck we're using four bit quantization for that before loading it in we differentiate between the tokenizer and the model and the tokenizer converts the text into individual words or tokens which the model can then use to create new text we load it in with the transformers pipeline which is something we generally do we give the load temperature the temperature indicates how creative the model is <clears throat> The temperature indicates how creative the model is with respect to the text it outputs. I like giving it a smaller one because I'm not a creative person. Uh, no, not really, but you can, you can choose whatever value you want and what works for you. The number of tokens it creates, if you do give it a, um, a small value, it will only create a small number of tokens. This really helps if you want, to, want it to output just a single answer, something very specific and small. And we give the penalty for repeating a lot of text. Now Llama 2 uses a very specific template. It looks more difficult than it is in reality, but it helps differentiate between 
models, um, the, the answer of the model, the answer of the, of the user or the question that the user has. Generally, it contains a system prompt, a starting set of instructions, then the question of the user and the model's answer. It's separated with certain tokens like the sys token or the inst token to show whether it is the start of a question, whether it's the end of a question, when the model's answer starts. It should be relatively straightforward if we just go to an example. Here we have the system prompt. You are a helpful assistant. That's our Llama 2 model. And then I simply ask it the question, what is one plus one? And what it has generated is, well, a good answer, right? Oh my, that's a simple one. The answer to one plus one is, drum roll please, two. So it's a very happy, go lucky assistant that we have. It's not really that straightforward. Look, the answer is two. Um, but this is the type of assistant that we have. And we can change it, of course. Uh, we can say, okay, you are an assistant that just gives this answer or just gives this output. Either way. This is the template that you should use for a Llama 2 like model. Now let's go to the very first step of, of fine tuning or improving your large language model, prompt engineering. Now prompt engineering is something that works way better than you might expect. So normally we would think about, okay, we're gonna fine tune the model in itself, but the way you ask a question has a huge effect on the performance of such models. And one such method is example-based prompt engineering, where we essentially give the model a few examples of the output that we want or the answers that we want or the use cases that we have. You can give one example, multiple examples, but if you give it no examples at all, it generally performs worse than giving it examples. And to give you an example, let's repeat that word hundreds of times, um, again, you're a helpful assistant. And then we asked, we asked the large language model to classify the text into neutral, negative, or positive. And the text that we have is, I think the food was okay. Now, after generating this text, it tells us neutral, the food was okay. The word okay is a neutral term and doesn't convey a particular positive or negative sentiment, which I agree with, which is really nice. But the problem here is I just want the neutral output. I don't want all that fluff along with it. I'm interested in the answer, neutral, because I'm creating a classification algorithm. So what we can do instead is we can say, okay, let's give it a few examples, or this, this case, just one example. We say, okay, classify the text into neutral, negative, or positive. The text is, I think the food was all right. And the large language model has then given it the label neutral. Then if we give it the text, I think the food was okay. What we then would expect is that it give the output neutral without anything else. And it just does that. This is great because it helps us fine tune the model to what we want as an output, but also the answer in itself. We can show a few examples of the kind of output that we're looking for, but also if it would have said, I think the food was all right, it's positive, we can correct it. We can say to the model, look, if the text is, I think the food was all right, it's actually neutral instead of positive or the other way around. We might feel like that I think the food was all right or was okay is actually a positive sentiment. Sentiment still is a somewhat subjective concept. So this way we can guide it and tune it towards specific answers. Now that's the first example of prompt engineering. The second one is something called thought-based prompt engineering, where we allow the large language models to have thoughts. And those thoughts are essentially just steps. It works out before giving the final answer. And like us, if we work out specific steps, then of course the answer generally tends to be better instead of just answering the question. So what we normally do is we have input outputs. We have a prompt, what is one plus one? And then we have the output, the answer is two. But if we ask the model to break it down into steps, then it first shows its reasoning before actually giving the answer, which 
really improves the performance. We can make it way more difficult with something called free of thoughts, where it generates a number of thoughts that we choose from. And then we take that thought and we build on top of it. And we continue on this process until we get to an answer that we are happy with, but the LLM apparently also is too. We're going to show you an example of chain of thoughts. And, you know, these types of images, they, they, they look quite difficult, but in practice, it's really straightforward. So let's say we have another prompt. Do the odd numbers in this group add up to an even number? And then we ask it to solve it by breaking the problem into steps. And we identify the steps that it needs to take. And when we do something like this, the output that we get is a little bit more than just, okay, this is the answer. It will give a large description of each of those steps and go through them. Also means, uh, also the reason why this takes a little bit longer to load because it generates more tokens. It gives us the answer, or at least a very long answer, but it divides that into steps. It says, okay, step one, identify the odd numbers in the group. Then step two, add the odd numbers together. And then step three, uh, step three is the result odd or even. And obviously 23 is an odd number. And therefore the sum of the odd numbers add up to an odd number and not an even number. But by breaking these things down into steps, it holds itself accountable to what it has done before because it has identified the odd number. So it kind of has to use that information when creating something else. I mean, it's an autoregressive model. So anything it already has generated, it can use as information for its next steps. The second way to improve your large language models is called retrieval augmented generation or RAC. And in RAC, we essentially give the large language model an external knowledge base, information that it has not seen before that it can leverage to give its answer. So let's say we have a very tiny knowledge base, a few sentences, Llama 2 is an LLM, Llamas are cute animals, and RAG is an AI framework. And we have a prompt, what is Llama 2? Now Llama 2 might not know about itself and has no knowledge about what it exactly means to be a large language model. Instead of fine tuning the large language model on all that knowledge base, we can give it external knowledge. What we first do is we convert both the knowledge base and the prompt to embeddings using an embedding model. And those embeddings are numerical representations of these texts. And we save them in a database, which is uh, fancily called a vector store. We save all of these sentences, documents, whatever kind of knowledge that you have. And then when we ask, what is Lama 2? We do similarity search. We search the vector store for things that are related to the question, what is Lama 2? And what we see is that in the knowledge base, we see that Llama 2 is an LLM is very similar to what is Llama 2. So we take that information and we give it to our LLM. We say to the LLM, the prompt is what is Llama 2? And we have some external knowledge for you. We have these and these lines of information that you can leverage to answer your question. And then it will give the answer. Llama 2 is a large language model and successor uh, to the popular Llama model, which was released open source. Just to give an example. Implementing this with, with Langchain, super straightforward. We first create a very small knowledge base. We have a couple of sentences about Llama and Llama 2. We run that, we save that into our tiny knowledge base. It's a small text file that we can use and give to the, um, to the large language model. Then we choose the embedding model. The embedding model that I'm using here is a sentence transformers model, which does exceedingly well converting text, um, small passages like sentences or paragraphs into numerical representations. And like the LLM leaderboard, we have also a embedding leaderboard, a leaderboard that shows you the best performing embedding models. There are a bunch of them, Currently, the BGE and the GTE models work exceedingly well, 
but you have to take into account that with such a leaderboard, the top ones are slow. Nine out of 10 times they are relatively slow and you want them to be fast, especially if you have a very large database of information or external knowledge. So what we're using is a sentence transformers model that's fast, but also quite accurate. So after loading our embedding model, we will start creating the database with LangChain. We have our documents, which is our tiny knowledge base, and we split those documents up into certain chunks. And that is really necessary if we want to make sure that the embeddings correctly represent the text because the embedding model has a token limit and we want to make sure that the documents stay within that token limit. So next we can create our database. We run this piece of text and we've created a small local vector database that we can use to quickly find documents that are interesting to the prompt input. Then for our rack pipeline, we're using Langchain. Langchain really is one of the best methods or the easiest one at least for creating chains of LLMs. In this case, our rack pipeline, we're giving it the LLM that we have, so Lama2, and our database. Creating that is relatively straightforward. And the great thing about splitting up the LLM with the rack pipeline is that we can check the performance of using it with and without retrieval augmented generation. For example, we can simply ask the question, what is Lama2 to the LLM and what is Lama2 to the rack pipeline? And you will notice that the answers are quite different. What is Lama2 will generate an answer that doesn't really relate to the Lama2 that we are interested in. Whereas the rack pipeline will create an answer that is more tuned towards the input that we give it because we gave it a number of documents that explain something about Lama2 as a large language model. It took a while, but they're finally done creating the answers. When we ask Lama2 what is Lama2, it tells us it's a cryptocurrency, which I hope is not the case, because otherwise we're using now cryptocurrency as a large language model, which doesn't really work that way. If we do it with the rack pipeline that we have, then it tells you that it's a collection of pre-trained and fine-tuned large language models. That's information that we have given it through our external knowledge base. As we can see, just giving it external knowledge without actually fine-tuning the model gives us way more accurate answers. Imagine if you're using um, organization external knowledge base all information that you have about your specific product or maybe your user base or whatever it is that you're interested in. By simply giving it, it can sort of reason about its external knowledge. Now the last step is parameter efficient fine tuning. So you might have expect fine tuning of course is one of the ways that we can improve the performance of a large language model. But we're not looking at regular fine tuning we're going to be looking at parameter efficient fine tuning. And there's a big difference between those two. So in regular fine tuning, we update all of the weights. We have some sort of input in our model, which, which can be uh, certain weights or embeddings or whatever it is. It goes through pre-trained weights. So a transformer block, for example, and then outputs some sort of representation, for example, embeddings. And those pre-trained weights, we typically update. So the model that we just loaded was 13 billion parameters, and we can update all of those parameters. But there's really no need. There's a lot of information contained within the large language model that does not need to be updated. It's already accurate representations. And when we're saying fine tuning, we're not we do not necessarily want to change the entire model. We want to change certain aspects of it, nudge it towards certain directions instead of changing the entire model. And that's where something called LoRa, low rank adaptation comes in. Essentially what we're doing is we're updating a small representation of the weights. And that small representation is sort of a compression of the original pre-trained pre -trained weights. We keep those frozen, we keep them as they are, and we derive 
it compressed a sort of smaller version of those pre-trained weights. So instead of 16 or 13 billion parameters, we go to just a couple of million ones to fine tune it. To do this, let's first start looking at the data. I've prepared a couple of them, but I really like using the Open Assistant Quantico data set. So we load it in, but we also already save it to file because that makes it a little bit easier to use. After that, we take a look at one of the documents that we have. And there's a lot going on here, but what you might notice is that there's a tag for human, which is us obviously, that, that asks the question, and then the assistant that answers the question. If we print it, it might look a little bit nicer, right? It has some <laughs> references, apparently I wouldn't necessarily trust those. And then it tries to explain it to a dog, which doesn't necessarily make sense, but you know, that's the data that we have. But it also shows that when you download these data sets online, it might help to just take a look at it and maybe, you know, remove those things. Because I don't think it will help the performance that much. But for the sake of simplicity, let's just show you how to use this kind of data um, in fine tuning setting. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use this data to fine tune a base model, which is a non-chat version. So we just load it in a chat version and instead we're loading in a non-chat version and making it essentially a sort of a jet GPT type of model. If you take a look at a few couple of more examples, you will notice to see, okay, we have here a human asking a question and an assistant giving an answer. And that's what we want the model to be able to do. That's also the template that we're going to be using for our fine-tuned model. Whenever you ask a question, you need to template it like this. You need to say, okay, human has a question, then you prepare this small string for the answer. Now, fine-tuning a model like this, super easy, especially if you're using AutoTrain. AutoTrain is a framework that allows you to fine-tune such a model in a single line of code. Uh, there's benefits to this because obviously single line is amazing. The disadvantage really is, is that you're, because you're not in the nitty gritty of the code, uh, it might be difficult to understand what exactly is happening here. Either way, this is a great way to start with fine tuning your large language model. We're mentioning first that we're training a large language model. We give the name, in this case, Lama Chat, and the model that we're using is a non-chat version of Llama 2. It's a sharded model and that helps us to more easily train it. The data path that we refer to was the train.csv that we just created locally. And we're using parameter efficient fine tuning. So the LoRa based method, instead of you know, fine tuning always, we're fine tuning just a very small compressed representative sample of that. You can obviously change the learning rate, the number of train epochs. And what we're doing here is something special. We can choose to save the LoRa separately from the base model. And this is an amazing feature to have because it allows us to create different LoRa's for different solutions. And those LoRa's are really small. They're like a hundred megabytes or so. Whereas the Llama model, it's dozens of gigabytes, which doesn't do well for saving these kind of things. We can, however, we merge them and create an entirely new model. Uh, this helps if we want to use it in production or just for the sake of simplicity. Because I like simplicity with these kind of things, let's just merge them. But remove this line of code if you do not want to, uh, if you don't want to merge them. And we can run this, it will take a while, and I'll show you the output here. Um, it loads the data set from the CAV, uh, CSV, it creates a trainer, um, and then it starts slowly training. And this training procedure can take quite a while, it depends on the size of your data, your batch size, um, the number of training epochs that you want to use. But that's essentially it. After doing that, you will have fine-tuned your model for the data set that you have.
And you would still need to test that obviously with the code that we've shown before to make sure it works as you expected. Now what we've gone through so far were three methods for improving your large language model, prompt engineering, RAG, and fine tuning, but they're not independent methods. You can use them all on top of each other. So after we're done with prompt engineering, we can do some retrieval augmented generation and fine tune our model. But we're actually doing, we should be doing it the other way around. We start by fine tuning our model on some specific data that we have. We then give it external knowledge base. And then lastly, we do some prompt engineering on top of the rack pipeline that we have and our newly fine tuned model. Combining all of these steps will do a lot for your specific use case. And if we're being serious here, I would just start with one and then maybe two. Fine tuning your large language model sounds interesting and maybe the most accurate one and it could be the case, but there's so much to be gained from just starting with prompt engineering and rag based pipelines. These models are super accurate already and they can use the external knowledge to their advantage. So start with one, go up to two and only do three if you have to compute the knowledge, uh, a team to really work on fine tuning these kind of models. There's so much you can already do with just basic prompt engineering. Now that's it for this video. If you liked it, uh, leave a comment. Uh, you don't have to leave a like if you don't want to. But if there's something you want to see changed, if there's something you want to see improved, or if there's something else you would like to see in these kind of videos, please let me know. It really helps me understand what people enjoy and what kind of content they're looking for. Thank you for watching this video and I'll see you next time.